Good evening. I'd like to thank you very much for coming out this evening for a very special guest that we have to speak with us. Uh, before I introduce him, uh, let me just tell you about what we have planned for the rest of the year. We're coming down the home stretch. We don't have any more lectures uh, this month, but in November we actually have three different events that we hope that you'll be able to, to attend. Uh, on November 6th, Eric Douglas will be presenting West Virginia Voices of War, Oral Histories from West Virginia War Veterans. He did a documentary, and, and I think you would be pleased to, to come and see that. On November 13th, maybe a familiar name, Ann Montague. She's going to be doing a program on Rosie the Riveters, and she'll have some, some guests with her as well. So she's very interesting and, and has a, a good topic to talk about. And then we'll be closing out our year with, with one of our favorites around here, uh, Jim Mitchell from the State Museum, uh, who will be doing firearms throughout West Virginia's early history. And he'll be showing off a lot of the uh, weapons that he keeps downstairs under lock and key. So we hope that you'll make it for that. Uh, tonight's speaker is a, is a good friend of mine and a very, as I said, a very special guest. Uh, Dr. Robert Conte has been the historian at the Greenbrier since 1978, and that sounds like a pretty good job, doesn't it? Uh, he was responsible for actually establishing the archives uh, of the Greenbrier's historical materials. He actually uh, gave me a tour of those one time. It's a very fascinating uh, collection that he has. Uh, during his tenure, the secret underground Cold War facility, the bunker, of course, uh, was acknowledged, or, or he can tell us about that. And resort ownership passed from CSX uh, over to current owner, a familiar name, Jim Justice. Uh, Dr. Conte is a native of San Jose, California. And I think he made it out there this summer for a reunion. Uh, he received his bachelor's degree from Santa Clara and was in the military for several years and then received his doctorate from Case Western in Cleveland. Uh, before working at Greenbrier, he uh, was at Western Reserve Historical Society, a fine institution in Cleveland, and he worked at the National Archives. Uh, he is the author of The History of the Greenbrier America's Resort, which was published in 1990, was uh, revised in 1998, and updated in 2010. Uh, he's also produced a historical chapter for a coffee table photography book entitled The Greenbrier America's Resort. And he's also been involved, he was involved in creating a DVD in 2011 entitled A Brief History of the Greenbrier. Uh, he's written numerous articles uh, for publications. He's contributed to newspaper articles, books, and museum exhibits. We were talking on the way over here. He was just interviewed recently by CNN. I think that's a, a pretty regular occurrence for him to interact not only with local media, uh, but with national media. Uh, he currently serves on the West Virginia Archives and History Commission. In fact, he was the chair of that body until very recently. Uh, he's a member of the Board of Directors of the Preservation Alliance of West Virginia and the Board of Directors of the Greenbrier Historical Society. If you would please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Conte. Well, thank you, Joe. I don't have to stand in frame here. Is that part of the deal? <laughs> Make yeah. me chase you. <laughs> I'm impressed. A little tornado is not going to keep you guys at home, huh? Yeah. Really. I'm not going to worry about that. So, Joe tells me in 60 minutes I have to tell you the whole history of the Green Bar and my entire life story. Uh, so, uh, so, this ought to be interesting. So, we're going to zoom right along here. And then if it raises more questions and answers, then we chat at the end. How's that? Okay. Uh, and you know, I've always been told it's good to start a, uh, a talk out with uh, with a joke or something humorous. And how's this? This is what I look like uh, before I started working at the Green Bar. And uh, actually, I put this in here. It's my 30th birthday. A little little little, uh, little Jerry Garcia and a little Tom Wolfe is kind of what we're going for here. And uh, and uh, and the Jerry Garcia references. I noticed that um, uh, the author of Hippie Homesteaders was. Part of this lecture, right? And so to sort of put all this in context, that's how I ended up in West Virginia. You know, not that I mean I didn't even have the qualification to be a hippie, much less a homesteader. But you know, at this point, I got a PhD. My 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 uh, career was not materializing. And uh, so what do you do? You move to West Virginia, right? 
and uh, specifically to Monroe County, the most beautiful county in the state, for sure. And uh, because there were a lot of back to land people there, so it made an interesting place to go. And then, uh, a couple years later, I'm a historian of Greenbrier. Now, I know that these pictures caused gales of laughter to my children. Uh, and uh, the first one, they really don't believe is me. But this one, Dad, what were you thinking with those glasses, really? I mean, and so it's clearly 1980, right? And uh, this was my first uh, encounter with the media, which I have learned to love. And, uh, and uh, so any, any cameras, so don't, you know. And uh, this is done for an article uh, that was out on the, on the AP uh, well, 30 years ago. Uh, anyway, and uh, the article was about the, the Green Bar having an archive, so that I had to look sort of archival here and got some, uh, some old, um, old books here. Uh, so, it, it, indeed, what Joe says is true. I was hired to go up in the attic where nobody else wanted to go and find out what the Green Bar had. You know, uh, they really, it's stuff that just sort of accumulated willy-nilly over the time, and there's some pretty neat things in here. Here's the oldest photograph we have. Wow. Now, it's actually a photograph of a daguerreotype. Uh, a guy named Jim Patton came by one day and amazingly enough had this, had this daguerreotype. I couldn't believe it. And uh, yeah, so that's the deterioration of the daguerreotype. So this is, uh, this is before the Civil War. You know, this is dawn of photography, right? It's got to be like the 1850s. One way I can tell is by the statue there on the Spring House. Uh, that, that was somehow lost during the Civil War. So uh, uh, if you noticed in that first picture, there was a different statue. So the spring house sits over the spring. That explains why there is a green bar. We have a lot of people who have driven many miles <laughs> and they get there and they're, you know, where is this place? And how come it's taking me the better part of the day to drive here from wherever? You know, why, why? And I certainly remember this reaction when I first saw the green bar. Uh, you know, I was going down to pipe stem. I lived in Washington, going down to pipe stem, drove through White Sulphur, drive on the property green bar. Damn, look at this place. This is an unbelievable place, and it's in the middle of nowhere. Now, why is it there? So spring is the answer. The fundamental question, why is the green bar where it is? Uh, is the, the spring is uh, mineral water, and, and, and the resort literally develops around it. So if you've been on the resort property, and incidentally, I'm here to encourage you, come on down, you know, come on with all sorts of good things to do around the green bar. It's not like the old days when we didn't want you there. Now in the Jim Justice era, it's okay, it's okay. Are we going to edit this? Uh, <laughs> anyway, and um, uh, anyway, so yeah, and so you know, coming down the spring house right in the middle of the property. So this is one of the oldest photographic images, and one of the oldest pieces of paper we have is actually an account book from 1817. This tells you something about the Greenbrier, the oldest thing in our collection. It basically tells us whether or not people paid their bills, is what it tells yeah. us. And uh, this is Henry Clay, Henry Clay, servant of three horses arriving on the 20th of July of 1817. Uh, and, uh, you know, traveling on the James River and Canal Turnpike, I'm sure he came right by here after he, he stopped and they took the waters. Kind of interesting, what he had, had to get a dram for his servant. I'm not exactly sure what a dram is, but I'm sure it involved drinking. I uh, had to buy some cigars. It's interesting, it his right here, $1.50 a night. So three days, $4.50. Uh, back then it was half price for servants Horses and children, they're all in the same category, you know. So 75 cents for his servant. And it's the horses that ran out the bill, $6.75 for three horses. And then he had to get some extra fuel, some grain to go on the way. So he ran out the bill at $16.51 for three days. Now, of course, what our accountants have noticed is you see down here it says paid in full, $16.25. <laughs> so he's owed us, what, uh, 26 cents for uh, about 200 years now. Somebody has calculated the interest, I'm sure. So I, I like to mention Henry Clay because I think Henry Clay is really the person who made the Green Bar famous as the place where famous people gather. And Henry Clay was really the first celebrity who came on a regular basis. Uh, you know, Henry Clay, uh, you know, when he was running for what three time a nominee of the, of the Whig Party, he certainly did lots of politicking uh, at, at uh, White Sulphur Springs. He would have called it White Sulphur Springs back then. And really, over a 25-year period, uh, he probably made a dozen visits. This is one of the ways. You know, we've gone from Washington to Lexington, Kentucky. It's only here or up through a Wheeling. <clears throat> and coming this way, you know, he could do a little schmoozing. And the thing about Henry Clay, you know, most people, when I mention Henry Clay, you know, Henry Clay, which one is that one? Uh, uh, and, and maybe if I say great compromiser, they say, okay, great orator, okay, now I got it. But he also was a, a very charismatic one-on-one -on -one figure. 
So meeting Henry Clay was a big deal. And people talked about it. I met Henry Clay up at the White. And uh, so it, it sort of became known as, so then we talk about all the presidents staying there. But really, Henry Clay was more powerful than mere presidents. And, and I think a lot more interesting to interact with. Anyway, so it begins, as it begins with the spring, and then it develops its cottages. So if you've been around the property, and we've got this big hotel that's sprawling all over the place on one end. At the other end, we've got a golf clubhouse and the golf courses. That part in the middle, the lawn surrounded by cottages, that's what was uh, on the property back before the Civil War. You know, we are pretty good, pretty good about maintaining the historical core. Been a lot of development in the last 150 years. But if Henry Clay came back and stood in the middle of the property, you know, it sort of look, you know, it, it feels sort of like a college campus. This is Alabama Row. These are some of the oldest cottages, the oldest buildings. The, the oldest buildings standing are the spring house that we're looking at. And we're talking mid-1830s, uh, Alabama Row. Now, these were cottages for um, well, 100, 120 years. Uh, I mean, I guess accommodations. These are shops today. Uh, in fact, these, these, these cottages and the President's Cottage Museum, they're right next to each other, uh, are the only two uh, cottages that are not guest accommodations. So, so the others, even though some parts of them are very old, have been upgraded, expanded, modernized a bunch of times over the years. So really, uh, a day trip to the Green Bar just to go to the Alabama Royal Art Colony and the President's Cottage Museum, which is one of the things I take care of, uh, you, know, you know, worth, worth the effort. So uh, there have been 26 presidents to stay at the Greenbrier over the whole history of the property. And the first five that were there, Van Buren, Tyler, Fillmore, Pierce, and Buchanan, were there before the Civil War when we were still in that cottage-only arrangement. This was the biggest and best cottage, and uh, that's why the president stayed in that cottage. You know, I often say, <clears throat> how many hotels and resorts have enough history to support a museum? Uh, this has been a museum, this was converted into a museum in 1932, so we have a museum. We've had a museum for uh, 80, 82 years. Um, and then that, of course, goes a long way uh, to establishing the archives in the sense that once you have a museum, then people donate stuff, and uh, you know, starting well before, before my time. Now, what develops there is a mineral spring resort. Uh, people are taking, you know, we're taking the waters, drinking and bathing in the water to restore their health. A summer resort, so the first 100 years, uh, White Sulphur Springs is summer only operation. We're at 2,000 feet on the valley floor there in Greenbrier County. And what it really is is the great summer southern social resort. So, how southern was it? Uh, here's my best piece of evidence Robert E. Lee and eight former Confederate generals just ha happened to be hanging around one day uh, in, uh, in 1869, a few years after the war. So, uh, yeah, very much that's what it was all about. It was a, the Saratoga of the South. But it was frequently called the Saratoga of the South. Goes to show you who won the war. Nobody ever called Saratoga the White Salt for the North, right? So we're the Saratoga of the South. But same idea. These were the representatives of the, of the resorts of the region. And so Lee was coming over from, from Lexington, Virginia. And uh, you know, he was the president of what's now Washington University. No PGT Beauregard here, J. Bankhead Magruder, Alexander Lawton, Henry Wise, you remember the governor of, of Virginia? You know, really, the, the funny thing is, the, the, uh, the celebrity, when this picture was taken, was this guy here, George Peabody. And um, George Peabody, who was he? Well, uh, if you ever read the history of uh, J.P. Morgan, the J.P. Morgan Bank, it starts with George, George, George Peabody. Uh, George Peabody was an American who established a major bank in London, actually a statue of George Peabody in London, in London and Baltimore. And because uh, and, uh, he had a Baltimore Road, he was a friend of a friend of Johns Hopkins, uh, anyway. And uh, so he started, had a business over there. He never had children. Uh, his partner was J.P. Morgan's father. So, after, so the firm passes on to him. So this, he's basically the founder of the uh, J.P. Morgan uh, fortune. And at this point, he's giving his money away. He was one of the great philanthropists, and really one of the first great philanthropists. Peabody College is part of Vanderbilt today. Peabody, Peabody Conservatory in Baltimore, that's the Peabody. And he was traveling with W.W. W. Corcoran. Gosh, did I just read they're closing down the Corcoran Museum of Art up in, uh, up in Washington? Uh, well, he had just found it that year in 1869. W.W. W. Corcoran, another banker turned philanthropist, started the Corcoran Gallery with his personal collection. So really one of the, one of the most famous pictures ever taken uh, at, at the resort. Now, it started as cottages, but by the, by the, middle, of, by the middle of the 1850s, it's pretty clear that the CNO, the Chesapeake and Ohio Railway, is coming that way. 
So the owners, right there on the eve of the Civil War, built a big hotel called the Old White. So there, the Greenbrier, we're going to see in a minute, gets here and gets, um, gets built in 1913. Uh, before that was the Old White, opened in 1858, and it's torn down in 1922. This is a great, great big image. Uh, you know, when I got there, part of me and the archivist was kind of going around, and this, this is a copy, but it's a great big print. I don't know how big it is. And it was at some obscure guy's office, you know, saying, wait, really, this office deserves to be, and now has a prominent place in the museum. Because it's really the, 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 the best image in 1883, when it was really a very big resort. One of those kind of funny ideas is that the resort in 1883 was actually bigger than it is today. If we measure these things in terms of number of people that you can accommodate, if we fill the green bar up today, uh, 12 or 1,300, that's about it. Uh, in the 1880s and 90s, 16, 17, 1,800 people. Uh, and that's because there were more cottages. So the old hotel was, a, was a, an entirely separate building. It's not part of the, the current Green Bar. The, the current Green Bar is over here. In fact, where the Green Bar stands today, you can kind of see more cottages over there. In the 19th century, the cool people stayed in the cottages. And then the sort of well, I didn't say this, but everybody knew. The clueless people stayed in the hotel. So the people who, you know, have been coming for many, many years, they stayed in the, in the cottages. And then uh, uh, here's the spring house. Uh, here's the museum that I was talking about. Uh, this view is kind of, you're familiar with the property from the, from the clubhouse back. One of my real uh, uh, thrilling finds when I, when I first started there, I, I traveled around. Well, I came here to do some research, you know, up in Morgantown. Certainly the Virginia State Library, the Virginia Historical Society, the Valentine Museum, that's where I found this photo, the Valentine Museum in Richmond. It's a great photo of the dining room in the, in the old White Hotel. We don't really have very many pictures of it. Don't really know what the inside of the old hotel looked like. Incidentally, it was a summer hotel, so it was torn down in the 20s. That's why it's not around anymore. Uh, and uh, if nothing else, it's kind of a scratchy and blurry old photo, but big dining room. You know, the, the largest banquet hall we have today, you know, if we really pack them in wall to wall, we can maybe get 1,100 people in what we call Colonial Hall. This, this dining room sat 1,200 people. So uh, feeding, feed, dining, not feeding, probably was more like feeding than dining, I would think, in an operation like this was a, a major preoccupation. And of course, everybody's coming by rail, right? So, so the CNO arrives uh, right after the Civil War. And uh, really, that's, what, you know, that's why the Green Bar survived. You know? didn't, it didn't, it didn't uh, fall by, by the wayside like, like Sweet Springs. It breaks your heart to go down and see Sweet Springs. And, you know, another owner bought it, and then he died. And it's just all these false starts over the last 20 or 25 years. And then I threw this one in here because every now and then, you know, when you're an archivist, something thrilling happens. And a woman from uh, uh, Pennsylvania called once and said, I have a picture, of, uh, I'm cleaning out my grandfather's uh, house. I have a picture of my grandfather at, at White Sulphur, do you want it? You know, you get a lot of pictures of granddad, some old guy sitting in the corner, you know. And, and I said, okay, sure, send it. Well, it's this picture. And uh, this is her grandfather here, and he played in, played in the band here, playing in the band. Uh, and uh, out on, on the lawn, so the big lawn, you know, I was saying the hotel on one end, the golf courses are on there, that big lawn, that's where everybody <coughs> gathered in the 19th century. And, and there were, you know, like summer parks all over the country. There would be a concert at about noon and a concert at about five in the afternoon. Anyway, just a great picture of the summer of 1902. And incidentally, uh, this is the bandstand in the back, about 20, look, 20 years ago. Uh, we reproduced that, you know, so we used photos like this. We lost some big oak trees, we had kind of a naked lawn. So uh, uh, we use photos like this to uh, reproduce the old bandstand. Now, the fact is, by the beginning of the 20th century, the Greenbrier is going, or, or White Sulphur Springs is going downhill. And, um, you know, the railroad, like most technology, uh, is, is a dual-edged sword, right? A lot, it made it a lot easier to get to the, to the property, but also a lot easier to get to a lot of other places. And, and it's sort of going downhill, and all it needs is, like a lot of us, all it needs is a massive infusion of capital, <laughs> and uh, that comes from the railroad. So on February 1st, 1910, the Chesapeake and Ohio Railway buys the resort. They build the Green Bar. Uh, so this is a great picture. You know, I've been doing, I uh, tell Joe, uh, you know, from November through March, I do slide presentation PowerPoints uh, for 30 years now, and every one of them has this picture. You know, it's like the perfect picture of the original Green Bar. I don't know what I've done, but the picture hadn't been taken. 
So the Green Bar Hotel opens on 101 years ago, October 1st, 1913, was the opening day of the Green Bar. And this is sort of a mini version of today's building. This is still the front door. The front door has always been the front door. And wings are going to get added on both sides, additions in the back. You know, I, every now and then we dig a giant hole in the ground, you know, and build a bunker and a casino. I would think if we counted up the square footage, uh, that the, the complex today is four times as big as it was when it opened in 1913. Uh, this is really when we started using the name Greenbrier. Uh, you know, it's really not that cut and dry, but basically we started using the name Greenbrier because of the county, the river, the plant Greenbrier, uh, with the opening of the hotel in 1913. It's really kind of a slower process. I've actually, and I've been there long enough uh, that I certainly remember uh, early on, I would say to people I work at the Greenbrier, and they would say, oh, you're at the White. And I'm thinking, well, no, I work at the Greenbrier. And, uh, well, you know, there was, there was White Sulphur Springs and Sweet Springs and Salt Sulphur Springs and, and Blue Sulphur Springs. And the way you talked about this was the blue, the white, the salt, the sweet, the hot, the warm. And, uh, and uh, so people called it the white. We're going, we're going up to the white. Uh, and, uh, and, and so, you know, you know how people are slow to change. You know, this Green Bar name is sort of a new name. We've only, only been using it for 100 years, you know. Maybe, maybe they'll go back to the old name any, any time. But this is sort of fading out. I've noticed the banker, uh, uh, Ralph Mann, died just recently. He was, he was the banker 60 years in, in Union. And I would go there and make my deposits. And he would say, how are things at the White today, you know? And uh, I, I remember a woman came by once, and she, the whole time she was visiting, she kept talking about the White. And I said, to her, now Gretchen, we've been calling this place the Green Bar for, you know, at that point, 90 years. How come you're calling it the White? She said, well, when I was here, if you called it the Green Bar, that meant you were a tourist. <laughs> but if you called it the White, that meant Great Granddaddy came here. And we're, you know, if that name was good enough for Great Granddaddy, it's good enough for us. So, well, all right, we'll call it the Green Bar now. It's been 100 years. So that's when we become a year-round operation. I wish we had more photos like this, more photos of, you know, kind of behind the scenes. Uh, and, um, but we really don't have that many. Most of you, know, really, most of the pictures we have were created for publicity purposes. So I remember a woman came in a long time ago, <clears throat> probably 30 years ago now, with this photo, and that's her dad, right, Papa over there, and I think that was Uncle Ira, and it was interesting talking to this woman. She had grown up in the area. She would gotten a job in the, uh, you know, what they called the newsstand at the time. And you know, every time I, I and uh, her, her, uh, her maiden name was Eagle, common name around there, and uh, every time I looked at this picture, I remember, you know, she, her father was on the construction crew building the Green Bar. And when she was about in her teens, 15 or 16, she got her first job working in the, in the newsstand. And, and she remembered seeing Woodrow Wilson walk down the corridor. You know, it's sort of a scary idea. I talked to a person who saw Woodrow Wilson. We're talking 1914 when Woodrow Wilson was there. Uh, it's kind of scary how far, those things really aren't that far back in terms of uh, human memory. And we, and we don't really have much, many pictures of the, of the staff. And so I was thrilled uh, two years ago, uh, the grandchildren of this guy, who has a great name, Emilio Pellegrinelli. <laughs> I'm going to say that again. Emilio Pellegrinelli, uh, his, his grandchildren, the three of them, they, they, for years they had heard about how granddad had started his career at the Green Bar, come over from Italy, started his career at the Green Bar, and they were finally going to make it to the Green Bar. Actually, the, the most amazing part of this is I got a call from the, uh, one of the granddaughters had married a guy. He called me. His name was Patty O'Donnell. <laughs> so <laughs> Emilio Pellegrinelli, great grand, what a good that picture. Anyway, was uh, Patty O'Donnell. Anyway, they showed up and they had this, uh, they had a scrapbook that Emilio had kept. And uh, it had all these great pictures. But uh, it, it points to a larger picture. Lots of Italian chefs came over, and they, a lot of them came to New York. Uh, and then they ended up down at the Green Bar because of this guy right over here. This guy's name was Frederick Sterry. Now, you don't know the name Frederick Sterry, but Frederick Sterry, Fred Sterry, is a big name in the history of hotels in America because Fred Sterry, if you ever see this name, uh, the, the phrase after it is going to be Fred Sterry, the man who opened the plaza in New York City in 1907. And the Plaza Hotel was a game changer in the hotel world until until the Waldorf comes along, right? Which Chinese bought yesterday, right? The Chinese bought the Waldorf yesterday. Oh, okay, but anyway, the plaza, this is one of my people from Brazil, I think. Uh, the plaza opened in 1907, and as I say, this, this set a whole new standard for hotels in America. And Fred Sterry was very involved. 
And so this gives you some idea. When the railroad bought the property and built the Greenbrier, they were going to bring the top people in because he was the first managing director of the Greenbrier. So he worked in, he worked in New York, and then Harry Tate over here was actually the guy on the property. And this guy, another guy with a great name, his name was Decatur Axtell. Decatur Axtell was a railroad guy who was a CNO guy who was given the presidency of, uh, of, of the Greenbrier. But Fred Sterry is the connection. If you're gonna if you're gonna operate a first class hotel in White Sulphur Spring, West Virginia, where are you gonna get all the people to do this? From New York. So a lot of people from the plaza, and of course Sterry knew all the other hotels. So, so Emilio Pellegrinelli's story of migrating to the US, getting a job at the plaza, and then being assigned down to, to the Green Bar is really a pretty common story. You know whose story that also applies to is Chef Boyardee. Every time I look at this picture, I want to say it's not. I mean, I don't think it is, but you maybe you've heard this story. Chef Boyardee got his start at, at the Green Bar. He was Alberto Boyardee, is who he was, and he was 19 years old, and he was a nobody. Uh, and then later on, he starts a, a restaurant in Cleveland, and people say, hey, that's good sauce, Chef, and he starts to can it. And then, you know, nobody can say Boyardee, so he comes up with Boyardee, but Chef Boyardee. I think I'm just going to tell people. <laughs> well, I'm going to assume I got some rail fans in here, so we got to look at choo-choo pictures, right? You would think it's another. You would think we'd have a lot of pictures uh, at the Green Bar of, of rail passenger, because really, that's why the Green Bar survived for a hundred years. I always tell people the Green Bar is one of the great railroad resorts of North America. You know, from 1870 to 1970, everybody stops right across the street at the train station. You know, people tell us today we got a bad location. We had a perfect location. We used to have, when this picture was taken in the late 20s, we used to advertise ourselves as just overnight from four fifths of the American population. Now, that's a new thing to tell. Oh, yeah. Well, Baltimore, Washington, Philadelphia, New York, Chicago. Uh, we did a ton of Detroit business. You know, you remember the CNO had one train called the Sportsman. Detroit, ran right by. Anyway, this is a great one. We've got two locomotives here. So this is the train station right across the street, if you're familiar with the property. It's now a Christmas shop. It's actually both. It's a Christmas shop and a train station. Uh, and uh, the two locomotives, that's pretty impressive. And I remember people telling me that it was not unusual since, uh, you know, since the railroad owned the resort, they made sure the best trains and the best schedules came by. And if you got on a train in New York or Philadelphia, uh, you wanted to make sure you fell asleep. There were certain cars, certain sleepers assigned to the Green Bar. So you want to make sure you fell asleep on the right car. Because uh, when they came by, it'd be really early in the morning, they'd come by, they'd detach the cars, the train would go on, and then you got up whenever you were, and somebody would pour your coffee and make the, the, the jaunt across the street. They don't do that anymore. Amtrak doesn't do that for some reason. <laughs> and here's another great uh, railroad. And this is a much more common picture. Right? It's probably about 1940, but here again, there's the train station. Lots of people showing up here. Uh, I'm really not sure what's going on here. Uh, I can remember when I first got there, people talking about how an activity in White Sulphur Spring that you were, you know, uh, if you lived in White Sulphur Spring on Saturday night, was to go down to this train station, see all the fancy rich people get off the train, you know, come here and get, uh, be entertained. Well, I'll show you some of the people. You know, we uh, we uh, we took an area here, we wandered around the Green Bar in the near future, right, right on the way to the, you know, the lower level where the registration is on the way down to the movie theater. We put a whole bunch of pictures of, of people who used to be well known. Well known and well dressed. I've selected all these photos, so it was a little, little hint to people that the Green Bar was supposed to get dressed up when we go to the Green Bar. Here's Condé Nast. Uh, Con the Condé Nast and the next guy we're going to look at, they're good examples of people who, were, who came to the Green Bar a long time 20, 30 years. They loved golf. Condé Nast, Condé Nast Publications. Condé Nast, there still is a Condé Nast company, right? Own the New Yorker, as well as 20 other magazines. But he started out with Vogue and Vanity Fair. And uh, so Condé Nast uh, would bring his artists and writers, bring his family down, really from the teens all the way up to the Second World War. Great shoes, really, really great shoes here. And he's looking out over the uh, golf courses here. The other guy is Charles Schwab. Now, every time I say Charles Schwab, we go, yeah, we know Charles Schwab. Ask, ask Chuck, right? Different Charles Schwab. This is Charles M. Schwab. This guy, this guy was a big steal in America. You know, when Andrew Carnegie sold his... Uh, his, his steel works to J.P. Morgan, Schwab was the middleman. So he was the first president of, uh, of a U.S. steel, the first billion dollar corporation in America. 
uh, and then he founded uh, Bethlehem Steel, and he loved to play golf. So here's another, he and Condé Nast are really good examples. Really, it's there in the 20s that the Greenbrier gets that reputation as where the, the wealthy industrialists come uh, to play golf. And, you know, it's hard to imagine, he would come down twice a year to play golf for two weeks, come down and travel his private railroad car. Yeah, Schwab was quite a character, in it. and I used this picture from uh, the newspaper just because he generated tons, you know, steel magnet plays golf at Greenbrier was uh, the headline all the time. And they're playing on the old white course. Now, the old white course is the course that the, uh, that the PGA Tour, the Greenbrier Classic, was played on, which was designed by this guy, Charles Blair McComb. So when the railroad bought the property, they built the Greenbrier in 1913 on one end, and they built the old white course in 1914 on the other end. And C.G. McDonald, Charles Blair McDonald, uh, really is the father of golf architecture in America. Pretty dapper guy, kind of a really arrogant guy. Nobody could stand him, actually. Uh, he, he was really abrasive. and yeah, Anyway, but he designed spectacular golf courses. And he designed, see here it says the National. He designed something called the National uh, uh, up on Long Island. It's right next to Shinnecock, if you sort of follow these things. And uh, this is a private club. You and I are never going to play the National. <laughs> like Mystery. You know, it's got 50 members and they're all 90 years old, and they're all multi-billionaire. Let's put it this way, McDonald built a house overlooking uh, the National. This was his masterpiece, and uh, that house just sold two years ago to Michael Bloomberg. You know, that Michael Bloomberg was all white, and which is why we went to such, a, uh, such, uh, such extent to uh, restore it a few years ago. Anyway, McDonald's a big, so it's kind of like Frederick Sterry. When the railroad bought the private, they got the best guy to run the hotel, and they, they got the best architect to design the, uh, uh, well, not only the first, but the second ball course here. And a little more behind the scenes here. These guys here, Buster and, Buster and the other guy, uh, they, were, they, they, were the, they, they were the caddies at the Green Bar for 40 years, I bet, you know. And here they are in the early 1930s. These are one of those, these great pictures. Look at these pants this guy had on. These are just spectacular yeah. pants over here. All right, here's a trivia question. Who was the golf pro at the Green Bar before Sam Snead? Steve Gagan, right here. Nobody's ever heard of Steve Gagan, but uh, he was a pro for many years. So these are the guys who ran the golf operation behind the scenes. Uh, and here's Alfred P. Sloan. Alfred P. Sloan was the president and chairman of General Motors. This is another one of those pictures I have on the, the wall of celebrities I was talking about earlier. Again, primarily because of, look at those shoes. I mean, really, look at that collar. Can you imagine the president of General Holden being such, being such a dandy? And, uh, and uh, Alfred P. Sloan did not start General Motors, but he's the man that took General Motors past Ford, and he was president, and, and he guided General Motors for 35 years. He was General Motors in the public mind. And the name Sloan, Sloan Kettering Hospital up in New York, that's, that's the Sloan we're talking about here. Anyway, uh, so this is 1930. The other reason I'm showing this is it begins a long relationship between the Greenbrier and General Motors. Uh, you know, in the 30s, in response to the Depression, the Greenbrier and a lot of other hotels started looking to group business. You know, group business, you know, in the hotel world, group business is steadier. Uh, social business, you know, just sort of well-to-do people, business goes up and down like this. But groups, when you have, they come in, they'll, they'll, they will go up and down, but not as dramatic. So you want to have a good percentage of your business if you have a big hotel like the Greenbrier with groups. So General Motors for, well, over 50 years, from 1930, I think I saw one of the last of these giant General Motors meetings in the early 1980s. They would bring their top executives from around the world, and they would basically buy the Greenbrier for a week. Uh, you don't see that much anymore at all. In fact, the last time I saw them, I saw them in 1983, they bought out the whole Greenbrier the night before. There was nobody in the hotel, and they paid for all the rooms in the hotel so that they get the rooms ready when their executives arrive the next day. People don't do that. People don't do that much anymore. But anyway, and I don't think it's an accident that General Motors was also the largest corporate customer of the railroad, too. So from the railroad's point of view, the Greenbrier was a nice little benefit they could you know, work with their, uh, with their big customers. Well, I'm going to assume all of you sat, sat, sat through Roosevelt, right? All, every, I, I sat there and watched every, what, seven, nine, 14 hours, watched all of it. <laughs> so we got to throw in Eleanor Roosevelt here. Uh, and this is 1936. And she's meeting with the uh, young ladies of Chi Omega Sorority. Another case where Chi Omega Sorority met at the Green Bar from the 20s through the 70s. Uh, and um, and 
this woman had received, I don't really know why she showed up. This woman, whose name I can't remember, received an award. Maybe they were friends, I'm not exactly sure. But in typical Eleanor Roosevelt uh, style, <coughs> you remember she had a, a, a column called My Day. Uh, so she spends one night at the Greenbrier, and then the next day she gets on the train and spends the next night, the next night, the Federal Women's Prison in Alderson, <laughs> and just down, just down, and writes about this. You know, well, it was quite a contrast between the privileged young lady at Greenbrier and the young ladies I saw at uh, at Alderson. And then I think she continued along to some of her, you know, some of her projects here in the state. Well, Sam Snead, I cannot overstate how important Sam Snead is in the history of the Greenbrier. You know, if you don't follow golf, I know we're always throwing these names at you. This one now, and they all, all run together. One of the best players ever in the history of the game, period, oh, man, in the top five, for sure. And Sam Snead starts in 1936 at the Green Bar when nobody knows uh, who he was. And that changes very fast. And, uh, and then Sam Snead was associated with the Green Bar all the way up to his death in 2002. So now there were some gaps in there. But 1936 to 2002, they were a really, really long time. And this is one of my favorite early Sam Snead. He's going out with Billy Burke, Johnny Goodman, and Lawson Little. In 1938, I don't think I need to point out that Lawson Little won best dressed golfer of the year in 1938. <laughs> Clearly, way ahead of the collar. There are some people who wore collars like that in the 70s, right? When I wore those big glasses, too. So uh, we, we're not going to talk about that. So anyway, this is 1938. They're number one of Old White. And the thing about Snead is he just kind of comes out of nowhere. And and in 19 this year he will end up being uh, the lead, the leading money winner on the tour. When the leading money winner meant seventeen thousand six hundred dollars for the whole year, yeah. and, and he used to repeat that all the time. Can you believe the whole year was seventeen thousand six hundred dollars? Well, the year before, the leading money winner had won ten thousand dollars. So really, it was a substantial increase. But Sam Snead is going to have you know that name. The, the pro at the Green Bar is going to follow him not only around the country but around the world for years and years and years. And, uh, and I also like to point out, since we always talk about the golfers, another great athlete at the Green Bar was this young lady down here, Martha Aurelius. Now, you've probably never heard of Martha Aurelius. But Martha Aurelius won gold medals at the 1924 Olympics and the 1928 Olympics. Her four, the 440 was her uh, competition. She won gold when she was 15 years old in Paris. She won two golds, uh, individual and relay, at the Amsterdam Olympics in 1928. Uh, and, and that's because her father, Charles Aurelius, was the swimming instructor at the Green Bar. He, he, he taught her to swim. This is at the indoor pool. Some of this tile is still left around here. And, uh, and, and by 1929, Martha Aurelius held more women's swimming records than anybody in the world. She was famous. But you know, after, back then, once the Olympics were over, you just kind of went home. You know, you weren't on, you weren't on the cover on, on the Wheaties box. You know, you didn't endorse shoes or whatever they endorsed. You know? So she just came back and she joined her father as a swimming instructor at the Green Bar. And I think it's sort of a bad story, you know, bad marriage and drink and she dies young and, you know, nobody's ever heard of her. But in the 20s, everybody who followed swimming at all knew the name Martha Aurelius. And also in the 30s, there was this whole revival of the, 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 the glorious days of, of the Old South. And we used to have Robert E. Lee Week. And Robert E. Lee Week was the last week in August uh, of each year. And it was to commemorate the visit to Lee. There was all sorts of historical pageantry went on. You know, this is right, the first year we do this is 1932, so right at the bottom of the Depression. And, uh, but it adds a little glamour, it generates tons of publicity. You know, they revive dances from, uh, uh, from the, from the post-Civil War era, did them in the, in the ballroom of the Green Bar. And I, really the reason I throw this in there, this has a lot to do with why I have a job at the Green Bar. Because as part of the Lee Week ceremonies, this whole concentration on things historical, they opened uh, the President's Cottage Museum. And that's kind of how a lot of the, a lot of the material that's at the Green Bar that ends up in this attic when I got there in the late 1970s really went back to this, uh, these years in the 30s when they were collecting for the, uh, for the President's Cottage Museum. You know, back in the 30s, the, uh, the CNO Railroad used to advertise its uh, passenger service as the route to history land. So you know, history was a history. History was a good thing back then. Well, the Second World War comes along and things change quickly uh, and dramatically at the Green Bar. Uh, and the Green Bar is, is put to two very different uses in the course of the Second World War. And to me, one of the most interesting things that ever happened at the Green Bar was that for seven months, 
1942, the Great Barrel was an internment center for enemy alien diplomats. So that State Department talk for German, Japanese, and Italian diplomats were in Washington, D.C. When, when Pearl Harbor was bombed, and then in that next week, you know, everybody declares war against one another. And so there are all these diplomats and all their, their spouses and children and all the people who worked at the embassy and all their spouses and children, a lot of people, that the U.S. needs to exchange. needs to get them back to Berlin, Tokyo, or Rome. In exchange, here's, a, here's another issue, there are American diplomats in, in Berlin, Tokyo, and Rome. So the Green Bar is sort of a temporary housing location. Here's a Japanese group. These were, we're talking a lot of people. There were uh, uh, 400 Japanese, 250 Italians. 600 Germans. That's because of all these kids. So here's the German the school children. You know, it wasn't very long before the kids were running all over the place. So this is why this is why school was invented, right? Let's, let's corral up these children, and uh, they turn the cottages into classrooms. So behind the scenes, the Red Cross is working out all very complicated. You know, everybody had broken off relations. You couldn't talk directly uh, on these exchanges. So it was all very complicated. Uh, and, and during that, so from, well, from December 19th, 1941 to July uh, 20th, uh, 1942, the Green Bar was closed to the public and it housed just the diplomats and their families until the uh, changes were effected. Then the U.S. Army moves in, buys the Green Bar, and for four years, um, the Green Bar was the Green Bar. It was Ashford General Hospital. And again, you know, from a personal point of view, I've always been really intrigued by this part of the story because my dad was wounded in the Second World War and he spent a lot of time in a couple of hospitals. He was off in the Pacific. And so I've always been very, I have a tender spot in my heart. One of the nice things that's happened over the years, I've met lots and lots of guys who were patients, people who had family at Ashford General. This is a brochure. Um, um, uh, this is Arthur, Arthur Bragdon. Arthur Bragdon, 40 years apart. You know, Arthur Bragdon came back. And uh, it, it, his family had set all this up. They had called Ed. It was a big, big deal. And I remember he, 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 the whole family, there were like three or four cars, they all pull up, you know. And he jumps out of the car and, he, and he's got this picture. And he says, We got to take this picture again, and you better know where it was taken. <laughs> well, come back, you know. Well, luckily, it was a no brainer. It's pretty obvious where it was taken. So, uh, so we got him over there. And that was the most important thing that we were going to do. We were going to read, because apparently this picture had been sitting on the dresser for 40 years, you know. So anyway, we got it out there. We had a, we had a good old time. This guy ran me ragged. We went up and down the property. So it, it, you know, it's dwindling. I don't run into too many people anymore who were there during the Second World War. But certainly 20 years ago, it was, it was, it was pretty common. Uh, one of the guys, I think, who left the biggest impression on me was this guy. His name was Irv Forniker. I, I met one of his friends later, and he said, Irv Forniker. He said, we had a lot of fun with that guy's last name. <laughs> So you want to say that slowly, Herb Forniker. And Herb, uh, Mr. Forniker, uh, had come down one year. And, and like a lot of people, his family had to drag him back. You know, they said, he was, he's always talking about back during the war, I stayed at this place. And, and then they said, well, Randall, why don't you go there? No, I don't want to go there. Well, you know, it was always very, people were very ambivalent. It was a hospital. Not, it wasn't a great place to be. It was a hospital. But anyway, he was in the van. And, uh, and he was from Wisconsin, I think. And he was a real great outdoorsman. And uh, so one day in 1945, his sergeant comes up to him and says, uh, General Eisenhower wants to go fishing. And you're going fishing with him. Oh, yeah? So this is 1945. It's after the end of the war in Europe. This is the Supreme Allied Commander. And, and this guy is supposed to go fishing with them, you know? And uh, so I said, and he said, it would just happen multiple times. They went out, there's a creek right through the, uh, the golf courses, and, and sometimes they went on down to the Green Bar River. He apparently did a number of times, and he said he, he learned pretty fast that his job was to help, you know, put the bait on the hook, and just sit there and listen to what Eisenhower had to say. That was his job. And he said, you wouldn't believe what he told me, particularly about the other generals. And I'm going, Mr. Forniker, what did he tell you? <laughs> 50 years later, he wouldn't tell me. He wouldn't, he wouldn't tell me a single thing. And uh, anyway, that sort of struck in my mind. This guy, this enlisted man, sitting next to the Supreme Allied Commander, uh, going fishing for hours in the summer of 1945. One of my favorite pictures. So the Green Bar becomes the, the hospital. The main diners become the mess hall. Nice mess hall, you know. What you're looking at here is an enlisted men's mess hall with crystal chandeliers. Now, maybe you had to be in the military to appreciate. 
I was an enlisted man. They don't usually have crystal chandeliers in enlisted men mess hall. Well, I was thinking about Eisenhower. I called up a couple years ago and said, I have a picture of my grandmother shaking hands with General Eisenhower. Can you tell me what's going on here? And uh, so this is grandma in that neat polka dot address. And so this is that period right after the end of the war in Europe, when Eisenhower comes back after the German surrender, he wants a little R&R. &R. He comes to Ashford General, uh, to the Green Bar. He stays in a cottage with Mrs. Eisenhower. And their son John, John just died, right? Their son John just died a little while ago. A well-known, they only had the one child. And, uh, and, and you know, it was just a little R&R. &R. And so during that stay, he goes across the way. And if you're familiar, when you drive into the Green Bar, there's a big, well, years ago, there used to be an airport. But now there's a big golf course over there. Well, there was a, a prisoner of war camp at the guard tower. There were a thousand of captured German soldiers over there. And this guy was in Colonel Hunter, was it? Frank Hunter was his name. He was in charge of the POW camp. And, uh, and, and he knew General Eisenhower, and that's his daughter. They went, they went to high school together, so that's what's going on here. But every time I look at this picture, uh, I think this, she's shaking hands with the man who beat Hitler. It's like six weeks after the end of the uh, Second World War. And while he was there, Eisenhower posed for a bus. So when you come to the Green Bar, you want to ask where the North Parlor is. We still, we still have this bus. It's in the North Parlor. So it was done during that stay in 1945. And it was done by this guy on the left, another guy, another guy with a great name. This guy's name was Archimedes Giacomo Antonio. We think he was an Irish guy that was uh, <laughs> drafted a long way. So the Green Bar reopens after the Second World War. Army leaves after the war is over. One of the great names in the Green Bar history, of course, is Dorothy Draper. So Dorothy Draper is a decorator who comes in and redoes the whole place, top to bottom, and really kind of sets sets the tone ever since. We're still decorated by the Dorothy Draper Company. It's still called the Dorothy Draper Company. She's dead. She died 40, 40, 45 years ago in 1969. You know, one of your options is Draper's Cafe. And, and so we very much keep the spirit uh, and the look of Dorothy Draper alive. And really, the, the fact, really one of the best things that ever happened in the history of the Green Bar is that once the war was over, the railroad bought it right back. In other words, there were a lot of hotels that were converted into hospitals. And many of them, when the war was over, as people were people, people fall into dickering. You know, who's going to get it? Who's going to get what? Uh, you know, in other words, uh, the hotels were turned into hospitals in 1942, and they weren't making post-war plans in 1942. So once the war is over, uh, what's going to happen? So Robert R. Young is a critical player in the history of the Green Bar. He is the by, he's the chairman of the board of the CNO Railway. By far, owns the largest chunk of stock. And he's the decision maker. He's sort of the Jim Justice of the day. So he wants he wants the Greenbrier uh, to come back from CNO, and he makes it happen. And you know, if it hadn't been for for uh, for Mr. Young, you know, it's kind of hard to predict what would happen. He also liked to play a lot of golf. You see, like Chris Dunphy was his buddy from the Seminole Club down in uh, Palm Beach. And again, you know, celebrity starts showing up. Here's our here's our Kennedy picture. You know, Patricia, Kathleen, and Eunice Kennedy, the three. Kennedy sisters. Uh, this is the reopening of the Green Bar in uh, April of 1948. Patricia Kennedy Lawford, Eunice Kennedy Shriver. And if you follow the Kennedy saga, the Kathleen was the one who was killed in an airplane crash. That's going to happen about three weeks after this uh, picture is taken. And Sam Snead is back. Sam Snead was off in the Navy during the Second World War. And the thing about Sam Snead was A, he was great, as I was saying earlier, but he also was a great rival of Ben Hogan. So Sam Snead. Ben Hogan rivalry was one of the great rivalries in golf. And in the 50s, you know, the Masters every year was kind of, is it going to be Sam or is it going to be Ben? And they played against each other probably, you know, every, every, every year for a good 15 years. Now, we just lost Bill Campbell. I, I, I know Bill Campbell, one of the all-time great amateur golfers from Huntington. Uh, you know, uh, um, you probably don't know Bill Campbell, but uh, I, I, to say the least, I'm privileged to have known Bill Campbell. He's sort of the ultimate what you think of when you think of the gentleman amateur golfer. He embodied, he embodied it all and uh, played in 33 consecutive U.S. amateur championships. Uh, one, finally won one in uh, 1964 and, uh, and you know, lived in Huntington, had a home in, uh, in White Sulphur Springs, president of the U.S. Golf Association, president of the Royal and Ancient Club of St. Andrews in Scotland. For an American to be a member of the Royal and Ancient was a big deal. For an American to be a president was unprecedented. The only person to be the president of both of those organizations. 
Anyway, this is one of those, uh, you know, back in the old days when we were a real class act. Uh, Bill Campbell, his brother Rolla, his parents, uh, Rolla Sr., and, and, and Joan, Joan Campbell is uh, still in uh, Lewisburg. But we have to talk about uh, uh, Bill Campbell, uh, certainly as famous in the amateur golf world as Sam C. was in the pro. So we all followed Ryder Cup last weekend, right? I never did get Ryder Cup figured out, what it's all about. Uh, but it was played at the Green Bar in uh, 1979, so the Ryder Cup trophy out in front of the hotel. This is back in the old days, a long time ago, when the Americans used to win Ryder Cup. So Ryder Cup is an old tournament, best professionals in the U.S., best professional men, versus the best in Europe. In fact, 1979 is a critical year. This, this tournament started back in 1927. 1979, it used to be Americans versus British, and the British team expands. And that's why it becomes much more competitive, and that's why people are much more interested in Ryder Cup now. There was a time the Americans just always won, and it was really of no interest. This is really kind of the end of the reign of, uh, of Americans. Billy Casper was the captain that year, uh, winning Ryder Cup. And while we're on, remember I was getting inter inter interweave personal life. I got married at the Green Press. So this is Betsy, my wife. We're, we're in office romance. Look at that, July 1st, 1989. Married out in front of the spring house. So we just had our 25th anniversary. Got back on July 1. You know, I never wanted to know exactly where to throw the bunker story. And you know, the bunker story really is a 60s story. Late 50s, a 60s story. Because it's a Cold War phenomenon. But in another way, it's a 90s story. Because, you know, it comes out in the 90s. So we'll talk about it chronologically in the 90s. And you know, the bunker isn't under the, under the Green Bar proper, it's under the West Virginia wing in the back. So this is the overt building that they built to hide the, the covert building. You know, when Joe mentioned that I was on CNN, well, once again, we're talking about the bunker. I mean, I simply cannot believe it. Here it is, you know, the relationship between the government and the Green Bar ended in 1995. So it's, you know, it's almost 20 years later, and uh, the media still loves them. It's a great story, right? It's a sexy story, you know? Secret underground bunker at that lavish resort. And uh, uh, even actually after it was acknowledged, remember there was a story in the, the Washington Post, and the day we all remember, May 31st, 1992, was the day of that story in the Washington Post, uh, about here the West Virginia wing is sitting on top of this 112,000 square foot bunker for the, the emergency reassembly point for the legislative branch of the federal government. So part of the, the continuity of government program which was enforced, and probably still is enforced under a different name, but uh, was enforced during the Cold War, where you know they assumed Washington was a target. So you had these you had these emergency relocation centers to move the leadership of the government out to provide for the continuity of government. Actually, after it all closed down, we came across or somebody somebody we don't exactly know who came by one day and gave us some pictures and said, "You have 12 hours to copy these pictures, and then we're leaving." And this was one of those, don't ask, don't tell. OK, we're going to do it. And uh, so we got all of these neat construction photos. I would suppose they were done by the architect of the Capitol, incidentally, who was the person really in charge. So this gives you some idea of the construction. Digging a big hole. There's the green bar right there. If you're familiar with White Sulphur Spring, the Catholic Church is across the way. And so they built two buildings at one time. You know, how do you hide something that big? Well, you build a, a bunker down here, put a big concrete uh, slab on top of that and then build another building. So what looks like one construction project actually is an, has an overt component and a covert component. Uh, this, this is called hiding it in plain sight. You know? <laughs> We're going to build it right in front of your nose and call it something else. And, and then this is Fritz Bukas. He was a government man who for years and years, you know, the, the story of the bunker isn't just building the bunker. That's only half the story. The other half of the story is maintaining it in a constant state of operational readiness. And that, that's what Fritz's job was. So that if the phone call came, uh, you know, there is danger of imminent attack on Washington, D.C., they figure about three, four hours before everything had to be up and running. So, and, and Fritz, and, and again, personally, Fritz also is my golfing buddy, you know. I just, I took up golf late in life. This is my excuse for every bad shot. Mm -hmm. I took up golf late in life, and he was patient enough to play with me. He gave me the, I've moved up to mediocrity at this point. Really, one of the great projects in the last hundred years of the Green Bar is the creation of the Green Bar Sporting Club, and uh, and that's a CSX project. That's before Mr. Justice. Remember, the, the Green Bar has been 6,500 acres of land since before the Civil War, and during the bunker days, we couldn't develop anything on it. You can't develop private pro you can't develop private homes on a piece of property that has a little secret clause to it. So really, we couldn't go into the whole 
private residential club business. That's all the other great resorts, the Breakers, the Homestead, the Cloister, the Broadmoor, all those resorts in the years and years ago. So once everything was cleared up with, with the government, after 1995 that is, we started planning on the sporting club. So if, here's, here's Interstate 64, you come through the gap, uh, Lewisburg's right over there, you get off the interstate right here. And so this is where the landing strip used to be a few five years ago. And so Tom Fazio built a spectacular golf course here. And uh, really what, what this has done, of course, it generates tons of revenue from the sale of the real estate. Uh, and they have uh, all, all their own amenities here. Uh, that all the sporting club people then come over and play the Greenbrier's golf course and use the restaurant. So, uh, I, you know, I, get, I picked one up five cents and had the 500 memberships, and we've sold 410. Mm -hmm. I'd get up first thing in the morning, drive right over with your checkbook, and, and uh, because this is, this, is, this is pretty high end. But, but, a, but really, a major improvement to the, uh, to the Green Bar. And here's Carlton Barney, who is Dorothy Baker's successor. So Dorothy Baker, I mentioned a minute ago, died in 1969. Carlton took over right about that time. He was right out of college. Carlton Barney has been decorating the Green Bar for 50 years. And I've gotten to know Carlton in the last few years. And um, last time I saw him, I said, Carlton, you know, I did the math. Carlton Barney has been decorating the Green Bar slightly longer than Mick Jagger had been singing with the Rolling Stones. <laughs> <laughs> Me and Mick, <laughs> you know the story. He was kind of flattered with that one. You see how he wears ties and match the uh, match the poster here. That's, that's Carl in the red sock here. Anyway, he's quite a character, and uh, so he, he is the one keeping that whole Dorothy Draper look going. And uh, speaking of using some of our archives, uh, Betsy and I went up to the uh, Museum of the City of New York about five or six years ago. They had a big uh, the high style of Dorothy Draper. This is really fun, you know, we got to stay in the Waldorf and travel in black limousines and get all uh, gussied up here. You can tell uh, Betsy's from North Carolina, a little uh, Carolina blue outfit there. Well, here is another of the great uh, momentous days in the history of the Green Bar, May 7, uh, 2009. This is Jim Justice announcing that he has just bought the Green Bar. And, um, I don't know if you followed all that, but there were some grim days around the Green Bar. One of my, one of my memories I don't think I'm ever going to erase is some, the two words I never wanted to see in bold headlines in the Charleston Gazette, Green Briar bankrupt. And, uh, and uh, you know, so CSX has put the Green Bar into bankruptcy. And we, in fact, did have a near-death experience. I know, I know, in fact, that CSX did consider locking the door and walking away. You know, things were getting that bad. And, in 09. And so, you know, I, it's not an overstatement to say that Jim Justice is the man who saved the Greenbrier. And this was a stunning turn. You know, we go to work one morning, there's an email, mandatory meeting for all employees at 1 o'clock this afternoon. Oh, man. We're thinking, well, I guess this is the end, right? And we all kind of walk down there. And then this giant guy walks down, and, you know, Jim Justice, I don't know Jim Justice, but. And uh, so, a whole new era begins, and here's the family. So they're going to be at Marshall, right, this weekend? They, they're going to be the, mar the Marshall at the parade? The Marshall's at Marshall? Anyway, Jim Justice, Kathy Justice. His son, Jay, who's taken over a lot of the, the business operation now. And then uh, daughter, Jill, who's, uh, who's, a, who, who's in a residency. She finished medical school last year. So the big reopen. Here we go. Here we go. I, I told Joe I threw this picture in here. I figured by now you'd be getting kind of sleepy. So this is perk up in your ear. It's really something perk up in your Jessica Simpson. This is the great, the great opening of the uh, of the casino. So certainly the, the biggest single investment. You know, Jim Justice has put. I lost track of 250 million dollars that he's put into the property. But the single largest investment is the casino. And all these folks showed up. A lot of controversy about that dress there. In fact, a lot of. I don't know, I, I'm just not sure what Jessica Simpson does, actually, other than pose for photographs. And then Governor Mansion, you know, and Gail, and, and with, uh, with our own John Girl, Jennifer Gardner. Now, do I have this right? This is July 2nd, 2010. Wasn't that the day that there was a big event for Senator Byrd? I mean, everybody came in, yeah. and I think it was the same day, yeah. and the Governor Mansion did that, and then came over and uh, party like it's 1999, actually. Yeah. <laughs> there was the Lionel Richie concert, and uh, and then the opening of the uh, the casino. You know, I mean, Raquel Welch was there. All these beautiful women. Raquel Welch was there. Jane Seymour. This is a bad sign to me. 
when Jack Nicholas, Tom Lawson, and Lee Trevino walked up together, wow, this is, now we're talking, three of the best golfers in the, uh, in the history of the game. And we even got my son in there, you know. Uh, Miss West Virginia was invited. She didn't have the date. Her boyfriend couldn't make it. So uh, Betsy, Betsy always thinking, you know. <laughs> him up and, and he got to sit with the VIPs and uh, sat at the same table with Jessica Simpson. Not, and sitting with Miss West Virginia wasn't bad either. And of course, the other big thing I think that Mr. Justice has done is that golf tournament. I really cannot overstate what that tournament does in terms of getting the green bar out to, to, the, to the world at large and really ratcheting up one's status in the, in, in the golf community. So, you know, I've been there a long time and years ago everybody said, nah, you can't have a golf tournament at the green bar. You know, there's nowhere the people are going to stay, you know, the golf, blah, blah, blah. Jim Justice came along and said, yeah, we're going to do it. And so we've done for the fifth time this year. Uh, and, uh, and the contract was on for another, I think, uh, seven years. Well, I threw the last picture in here. I, I saw Antiques Roadshow was here. I didn't, I didn't get a ticket. Uh, but uh, uh, we back in March, we had sort of a mini roadshow. And um, so Marcia Bemko here, uh, the executive producer. Ken Farmer is an old friend of ours. He's an antique dealer over. He's in Charlottesville now. And Mark L. Wahlberg. You always got to put that L in there. Don't be confused with the other Mark Wahlberg. And this is Ken Farmer's um, uh, business partner. Anyway, uh, we had sort of a mini event down there at the Green Bar in March, and what was and, and it was just one of the most fun weekends that Betsy and I have ever had. Turned out these all were wonderful people, and uh, and the interesting story they were telling was these things like in Charleston, they're so busy, you know, that they are all running all over. So they were thrilled. They came with their spouses and spent three days in the Green. Bar. You know, they had to sing for their supper, but they all had a lot of fun just kind of interacting with one another. Uh, and hopefully, they can get them back. Well, let's end with a pretty picture. You know, you always want to end. You, know, you open with a dumb, funny picture, and you end with a pretty picture. It's kind of how it works here. And um, uh, so this is we're using this on our website, so it must be our our prettiest picture. You know, with the carriage right over. You know, the casino is right under the, the wheels of the carriage. Well, let me give you some numbers just to sort of wrap it up, uh, just to give you some idea of the scale of the Green Bar's operation today. There are 710 guest rooms all together, including all the cottages. Uh, maximum capacity, you know, I generally say 1,300. You know, it, sort of, it fluctuates, depends on single occupancies and families, but 1,300 is a, is a reasonable number. And, uh, and it employs a lot of people, you know. And, uh, and uh, you know, you probably know uh, it almost became a Marriott. And a Marriott, of course, slashed the, uh, uh, the employment there. Uh, this year, we had a manager's meeting two weeks ago in Boston. We hit the largest number of employees ever in the history of the Green Bar, 1,900 employees when we were running full tilt there in July and August. So uh, way more employees than guests, a labor-intensive operation to, uh, to say the least. All right, Joe, did I tell him? Did I tell him what I was supposed to tell him? Did I do good? All right. All right. Did I leave any questions here? Now, Joe said I could sell books, but I'm embarrassed to say that these books are on a truck somewhere between Canada and here. So, <laughs> so we've just reprinted them, and uh, they haven't gotten back to the Greenbrier yet. So go online, History of the Greenbrier, exceedingly well-written book, <laughs> DVD. In fact, I'm going to give these to you guys. My DVD, and Carlton Barney did a DVD, something that ought to be in the archives. OK, I made Greenbrier reopen. Remember that Mr. Young? Uh, he, he had a good friend. Edward R. Statinius. If that's name rings the bell at all, Edward R. Statinius was Secretary of State back in the 40s. But he also was a business guy before. And Mr. Statinius suggested to Mr. Young, uh, he, Mr. Statinius had seen a lot of business people die young because they didn't check their health. He said, if you put a medical clinic at a resort with golf courses, I bet your busy executive will carve out time to check your health. So that was sort of the founding idea. And it started very small, and then, and then it, got, it, got up to, it got up to 10 physicians and a staff of 70. And it's in that West Virginia wing. And it's still going. There have been a number of retirements, so not quite a full tilt. But the big news is that uh, you know, the, the next story is the Greenberg Medical Institute. So where the saints were there, if you were follow the story, the, Saints being there, that building that was built, it wasn't just built for the Saints, that's the physical therapy unit. The 
The next building that should be under construction soon will be the uh, the sports medicine center, the surgical center. I think that means that means hips and knees and elbows. I think there's going to be a cosmetic surgery too. So <laughs> Get a new face and a new hip at the same time, and then and then the clinic will fit into that. So so that the clinic the current clinic is strictly diagnostic. Doctor Conti, my great uncle was a physician. That year today it is a very respected clinic. That years ago, real physicians, when they would talk about come for the cure, uh -huh. uh, knew that there was. Uh, a little gimmickry behind it. It wasn't. Now, when was he there? Your, your oh gosh. I mean, before the war? Yes. Sir. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, today it's a very respected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before the war. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. right. Yeah. But I wanted to ask you. There was a medical component to the spa right. back in the twenties and thirties. Yeah. Do you find um, a decline in? I, I grew up in kind of a strict household where I was lucky to have parents who taught us basic etiquette. Uh -huh. With Emily Post, Amy Vanderbilt, all you had to read your books. And, uh, you know, I can hear my mom and dad say, a lady or gentleman does not chew gum. Right. Bite your nails. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah. It, it seems there's a decline. It's so bad, Sandra Bullock uh, addressed it recently in one of her uh, speeches when a graduating class. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Do you find the, the dress code and very basic etiquette is declining at the Greenbrier, where it is well, so, uh, in so many areas. Right, yeah. Not I'm not going to answer yes. Uh, so <laughs> does, does that leave me? No. Um, uh, it's an issue. It's an issue. It's not a new issue either. I mean, I, I, when I got there 35 years ago, people were saying nobody dresses like they did in the old days. So it, it's, not, it's not a new issue. When I hear people you know, saying, oh, they don't dress like this. Well, I've been hearing this for 35 years, you know, and uh, and it's part of the large, you know, it's kind of like putting your finger in the dike, right? Um, it's a real issue. So we in fact have we in fact have up, upped the dress code for where it was really getting sort of funky was breakfast in the main dining room. People are going to work out. They got their little spandex outfits on, walking up to have breakfast. You know, um, you know we're kind of going. Uh, you know, and it turns out when you say something's casual, people have wide, wildly uh, divergent uh, definitions of what's casual. Uh, so actually, we have now, we have a little card, it's a business card, and, and, and the person will can hand that, you know, the, uh, the attendant, you know, basically says, you're not dressed well enough to come in here. And we turn people away, particularly at breakfast. And that, I mean, that's where the biggest issue was. And we enforce a dress code, code and tie, but it's just, it's a tough one. And then, and then the more you write, the more you write regulations, the more people are like, you know, what is this? Uh, you, know, uh, you know, I want the White House. And so it's a tough, and when somebody's paying $500 a night, it's hard to go up and say, uh, you know, we don't like what you're wearing. So it's, it's a tough line. And it's, and it's actually not a new line. I mean, not really from, uh, um, as I say, the whole 35 years I've been here, this has been a, this has been a discussion. But when you have something like New Orleans, New Orleans Saints come in, and then you're, you know, everybody in the brother got New Orleans jerseys on, uh, and Saints jerseys. Well, you know, what are you going to do? You know. But you know, you, you try and maintain it where you can. But it's, it's just not an easy, not an easy, uh, not an easy issue. When No, no, this was serious business. It was summer camp for them. Yeah, yeah. So they, they, that, we didn't really see very much of them. They were over there six days a week. They were, they were, uh, you know, because they bring in something like 90 players, and they're only going to be 53. So a lot of guys are, they're trying out for their job, and uh, yeah, they're not fooling around. And uh, you know, so, but that was another issue. Uh, professional football players walk around in sweatpants and jerseys and flip flops. 
and, uh, and, and they're also six foot seven and weigh 400 pounds. And, and you're not going to tell that, hey, Jack, in the wheel. They're over there, yeah. <laughs> it was part of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was even more dicey. Uh, but uh, um, so maybe we'll have a little etiquette classes. But really, for the most part, they, they, they sort of did their thing. They, they, weren't, they weren't wandering around. They had a couple of days off. And uh, we would play golf, but it was it was it was pretty much business. But it was about um, you know 180 people all together. So half of them were players, and then staff, and I don't know what these guys were. They were, work, but they were. Yeah, yeah, a lot, a lot of support staff. Um, and it's a three-year contract, so we'll see at least two more years of that. Were there ever flights uh, in Europe? Everything would go through Dallas. In fact, that was the idea. You know, maybe you heard about the train. In fact, the train is dead, <laughs> incidentally. Uh, the, the Mr. Justice had a plan to, to, to create a luxury train that was going to come from Washington to, to the Green Bar. It's a great story, but just last week they auctioned off all the cars, so it looks no. like that's not going to happen. But part of that was the idea was international people would fly into Dallas. And then, then we would uh, we would take them down to Union Station and, uh, and, and come down by. And this was a 13-car train decorated by Carlton Barney, and uh, a lot of money was sunk into it, and then it just didn't, it was gone. But 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 that, but that was part of the idea was to get that the European traveler coming into Dallas and then have the train come. Down. But you know, I don't think it's going to happen. Well, I know it's not. Are we still on here? Oh, thank you, Dick. <laughs> uh oh, here's a hard question. See, yeah, I mean, all of them are building up to the village of. This is not a hard question. There's another recent initiative that's the National uh, Tennis Center, is that correct? Is there a, new, hmm? a tennis center? A tennis yeah, facility? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, there's a very influential sporting club member who. Uh, uh, chairman of a very large corporation, which is a major sponsor of the golf tournament. And uh, so he has Mr. Justice is here. And, uh, and he's a big tennis guy. So I think he, he was really the, the force behind this, this new, uh, it's 2,500 people stadium, uh, seat stadium. And it's going to be right, if you know where the current indoor tennis building is, sort of behind it. And, uh, and really kind of a people area of property. But it'll be developed so that this kind of horseshoe structure, it's just one court, one hard true court. Uh, and then uh, it's run along Howard's Creek. So you'll be looking over the creek and over the golf course. I think that's going to be really nice. And so the idea, you know, we just had, we just had um, Don McEnroe and Pete Sampras is now the tennis pro emeritus. Things mean, you know, we came, we came up with golf pro emeritus for Sam Snead. I remember a reporter asked him once, "Well, what does that mean, golf pro emeritus? It means I can do anything I want." Because <laughs> <laughs> it was Sam Snead, you know. Uh, maybe Pete Sampras will do the same thing. But um, so it's just another way of, you know, beefing up part of the whole uh, sports operation, bringing in bigger championships, and then that can also be used as a little concert venue too. So you can have uh, musical. There in the summer afternoon with it. Pretty nice. Okay. But that's a softball question. Now you get to throw the hardball question. Yeah, hardball. Okay. <laughs> I don't trust Billy Joe. <laughs> um, anything else? Yeah. Have you seen the tornado? Have you seen the tornado? For, for a lot of years, um, it was about 6,000 acres, and then they've been oh, selling right. off. So, what? how much acreage is still part of? Oh, actually, oh, you didn't ask what I thought you were going to ask. Um, <laughs> well, well, if there's something okay. to ask, go ahead and tell me. I'll give you two answers. <laughs> uh, actually, the sporting club, theoretically, the sporting club is 2,000 acres. So what they did, it's basically a giant rectangle, the piece of land. And then they identified this long swath right down the middle of it. So the sporting club isn't just one place. I showed you the golf course. There are actually 15 different neighborhoods. So there's a cluster here and a cluster there and a cluster here. You know, 
And so, and, and there can be 25 to 40 homes, something like that, in, in, in each cluster. And then they're taking advantage of the, of, the, of, the, of the news and all that. So I guess theoretically, but since it's Green Bar land, and it's the Green Bar Sporting Club, you know, I mean, we, just, we kept saying 6,500 acres up until about a year ago, when I'm looking on our website and it says the Green Bar is a 10,000 acre playground. Email the boss. Wait, and that's a significant difference. You know? um, Mr. Justice walked the other mountain. So, Greenbrier Mountain is the one that looks over the golf course, and the other mountain on the other side is Case Mountain. Greenbrier only had has only about halfway up that for many years, and um, so we bought Case Mountain, and which of course is leading to rampant speculation, and so uh, so you got. Not worth coming here without giving you some gossip, right? <laughs> ski, ski resort. So, so if you hear any more, give me a call. You know, <laughs> uh, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know, but that's a big, that'd be a big deal. The ski thing, major. And I wouldn't put it past them, and Mr. Justice, but um, but the, it's it's really the, the contiguous land. Actually, the Green has been looking at for years. In fact, it's been studied for. In the past, it's not a new idea, uh, but um, uh, and, and there were all sorts of issues on my property. The family that owned it. And, anyway, so maybe it's just he got an opportunity to buy it, he bought it. That, that could be it right there. But of course, everybody's thinking, aha, you know, that, because you know the Green Bar loses money. And the uh, 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 Ted Kleiser was our president for years and years. He always used to say, the Green Bar has three problems: January, February, and March. <laughs> And, uh, and so that seasonality is a real issue in, in keeping it proper. And uh, so it would be a major investment, but well, we'll see. You know, Mr. Justice is nothing if not full of surprises. So, <laughs> so you know, like this whole tennis thing, just sort of, what? Tennis? OK. You know, I don't know where these things come from. Anyway, so call him up and tell me about ski resort. Maybe he'll do it for you. All right, I said everything I know. I run out of things to say. Does that make anything else?